So Mike, we've been involved in this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, the, the US media, myself included, uh, believed that China should be allowed to join the WTO, that they would become a responsible stakeholder in the international order that we had helped establish. Uh, we believed in the peaceful evolution of the Chinese political system. Um, so now the tone has obviously shifted. Uh, uh, so do you feel that it's a justified shift, uh, that the American media uh, is reflecting the reality, or has it become too short? Well, I, th I think, you know, if you go back, we chronicled China's joining the WTO. We chronicled what appeared to be steps that might lead to China becoming a responsible stakeholder. It was the Robert Zellick who invented the phrase, um, I don't think we were advocating it, we were trying to chronicle it. Um, and that, you know, that China has, China has changed. I think it's not so much that the press got it. There are lots of things the press got wrong, and it's certainly something we can talk about. But China has changed. I mean, the China that I lived through in the uh, late 80s, and, and then after it began to ease up again, early 90s, following you know, the, the repression of two, three years around Tiananmen, um, it really was changing. I mean, we were not making up this stuff about a more open society. Uh, and it was reflected in reporting that became much easier. It was always a headache, but it was much easier to do. You could go around more readily. It wasn't that hard to talk to people. Um, there were obviously lines that if you crossed, you would get into trouble. Um, but China has really changed. And under, under Xi Jinping. Und, under, I think some of it was beginning before Xi Jinping. Um, and I think the Communist Party was worried that the, the level of corruption and sort of rot in the system really could present kind of a mortal threat. And they kind of hired Xi to tighten things up. Uh, whether they, the, the elders who anointed him anticipated he was going to do what he did, um, who knows? Because as I say, we, we, really, we really don't know. Um, I remember Henry Paulson running around saying that Xi Jinping was going to be a great reformer <laughs> after he conducted his, his uh, corruption campaign. Oh, I, I found, a, I, was, I went online, I found a whole bunch of headlines in the New York, you know, opinion pieces in the New York Times and the South China Morning Post. Is she the great reformer? Well, oops, we got, the, got that one wrong. But you know, Chinese got it wrong too. There's an anecdote in the Simon China um, when she uh, put in the change to the Constitution to allow himself to, to essentially rule indefinitely. Jane Pearl, as of the New York Times, who, um, uh, told me about, she called this Chinese academic that she was in regular contact with, who was sort of nationalist-ish and largely sympathetic to Xi on many levels, and she said, what do you make of this? And she said he was like, well, I, I, I can't say anything, I'm just too shocked. So I think it took people in the Chinese system by surprise. It's not like we missed something, we collectively the press, missed something that was glaringly obvious that was evident in China. Um, and it's a function of the fact that we just don't know very much about Xi. Uh, and we know we don't know very much about the elite, really elite level politics. And so there's endless speculation. You know, maybe in a dozen years you'll find out more. But one of the things that was very interesting to me in researching the book is I went back and I read I watched a lot of the coverage. And it's really it's fun to go back and see what people were writing in the 50s and 60s. But what's striking to me is on balance, I would say the, the American press got it right on the broad brush strokes more often than they got it wrong. They got plenty wrong and lots of details wrong. But the broad outlines of the dynamics of the power struggle and all that, they basically got more right than wrong. So you don't think the, the American media, the Western media, fundamentally misread who Xi Jinping was? It just wasn't clear who he was. There's always... in. I mean, we just didn't know. So you project on it what you think, you know, okay, he worked in one of the provincial right. areas and his father was a quasi-reformist guy during the early days of reform. So you grab it, you, you know, you look for the crumbs or graph bit straws or whatever, and you try and construct the narrative because you've got to follow your story. Um, 
but we didn't really know. And I, he obviously played his cards. I mean, the, I think a lot of the high-level people he purged didn't really know either. Right. So the Chinese talk about the global discourse. Uh, they're masters of information and propaganda. Uh, and they allege that the Western media is engaged in a campaign against the Communist Party uh, the, uh, uh, by concentrating on th things we think are wrong. We think it's wrong that the Uyghurs are being essentially assimilated. We think it's wrong what they did in Hong Kong, wiping out democracy, uh, violating their agreement. We think it's wrong that the Chinese are supporting Moscow in the war in Ukraine. Are we, the Western media, projecting values we shouldn't be projecting, or are we doing our job? Well, uh, I think that, you know, if they, read, if they read this book, they would have a much better sense of, of how journalism actually works. There's an old joke that the two things you don't want to see the inside of are a sausage factory and a newsroom and for the same reason. Um, but, you know, American Western journalism at its finest has certain values that come with the craft of journalism. It's to hold the powerful accountable, to be a voice for the voiceless, to shed a light in dark places that powerful interests may not necessarily want exposed, and that's part of the democracy, giving people the information so that they can make up their own minds and, and, and behave accordingly. That's what, in a democracy, ideally, the West, you know, the, the, the media does. There are plenty of examples in the States and in Britain and elsewhere of how that's not always true in practice, and there are lots of issues about the media, but that is sort of where we come from. And uh, so you go to China, you're going to do the same thing. And partly it's also the definition of what's news, you know. I mean, I flew from Taiwan to San Francisco last week and my plane landed. It wasn't in the news, but if the plane had landed in the, the bay and we'd all died, it would have been news. It's just the way it works. And, and that's sort of what journalists do. I think anybody who's done this work will realize the notion of a campaign is nonsense. You get up in the morning as the CNN correspondent or the RTE correspondent, BBC correspondent, and it's like, oh, they want a story tonight. Oh, God, we've got seven hours to do it. We're going to get the video. Is there somebody we can get a sound bite for? Is the internet working to do a feed? And, and you know, people today are lucky that it's the internet. And when I did it, you had to drive to the TV station in the middle of the night and convince your editors to pay $2,000 for a satellite feed. And so all of these things, and before that, um, people in the book talk about going to the Dian Baldalo, the telegraph office in Beijing, and typing stuff out on a telex machine. Uh, I at this moment, I, when I do talks, I often ask people, have you ever seen or heard of a telex machine? I mean, in this room, I guess a lot of people have. But you'd be amazed how many people didn't even know what a telex machine is. It's like people who have done, never used a typewriter. Um, so it's the process that really shapes what goes into it. And the notion that there's some master plan is, is just nonsense. That doesn't mean that editors in New York or Washington or London, when they write the headlines or decide if the story is the lead or the, the end of the broadcast or whatever, aren't affected by the discourse, the daily discourse of what's going on. Um, and, and what's going on in Washington now, for example, is obviously shaping the tone. But for the people in the field, and that's really what Simon China is about, I don't think that really applies. You think it's going to get worse? You think the Chinese are going to ratchet up pressure on the Western media even further? It's hard to say. I mean, it's interesting. They haven't, haven't expelled everybody. Uh, in the last year, they have let in a few people, I think. Like the New York Times, I think, has two people now, whereas for a while it only had one. None of the people who were expelled have been allowed back in or allowed to go to Hong Kong. But they have allowed a few new people in. You know, it's, it's kind of a paradox. I mean, I think on the one hand, the Chinese leadership, you know, they want to see the international order reflect what they see as China's legitimate standing as this great power. On the other hand, they also sort of crave respect and legitimacy from the existing order and institution. So if you're a serious superpower, you need to have a New York Times correspondent there. Otherwise, you're not a serious superpower. So they want it, but they want to control it. And um, it doesn't cost them very much to have one or two people there because the, the, the dynamic, you know, the problems 
they create on the ground, the difficulties of getting around are such that, um, you know, they, they, they can sort of live with it. Uh, but the treatment of the press also is a barometer of the relationship. And the relation, if the relationship is going down, it's going to get harder for the press, I have no question. It's amazing what uh, Paul Mazur has been able to do from Seoul and Chris Buckley from Sydney. Chris is now in Taipei, actually, oh, really? which is the new center of China watching. <laughs> The new old center of China watching. I'm well, there too. So. Well, this is a related question. Could it reach the situation that we had before 1979 and that there is no Western media, no American media on the. But you, what you just I, said. I, I don't think so. I, don't, I, 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 th I, think, I think, you know, it, the, the, the Chinese need to be able to say, what do you mean we're giving them trouble? There's a Washington Post correspondent, there's a New York Times correspondent, there are three Wall Street Journal correspondents, uh, Bloomberg is reporting our. You know, flourishing stock markets. So they, they want that and they need that. And they've created a control mechanism where they can have it without generally uh, the press creating the kind of problems. Because it, it's no longer possible to do the things that were possible before. Um, for example, in, in Assignment China, Kathy Chen, who was a Wall Street Journal reporter, um, talks about uh, wanting to do a story on the great migration of people from the countryside to work in the big joint venture factories. So she went out to Sichuan and she got on a bus with these five young girls who were leaving their villages for the first time and going to Guangdong to work in a Mattel doll factory. And it was just her, there was no minders, just sat on this bus for five days and talked to these young women. And then she sneaked into their dormitory in Dongguan because she looked like them. She got a fantastic piece. That would effectively be almost impossible to do today. So the government can have it, sort of have its cake and eat it too, if I'm not sure if that's the right metaphor. But it's I'm going to ask one more question, and I will take questions from the floor, or I can, I'll keep talking forever if you wish. So imagine what, what would have happened if Chris Buckley had not been in Wuhan, Date Kong, and others. No. We might never know, have known anything about where COVID came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's the on the ground presence that allows us to have some some chance of understanding the, the dynamics internally. So if, if in fact more and more reportings have to be done outside by satellites, uh, we, it may become even more mysterious what's mm -hmm. actually happening yeah. inside China. I think it's very worrisome because uh, the the you know not being able to put your pulse on the society in a way that comes from just traveling around, looking at things, talking to people means that we don't really have a sense of the dynamic in the society. And because there isn't that kind of reporting, what does get in the news is uh, wolf warrior diplomacy and TikTok hearings and war over Taiwan. And that's probably because it's legitimate news. I mean, it's happening, got to be reported. But it makes the, the, the sort of depiction of China into the sort of one-dimensional bad guy. Um, Whereas the reality is it's a living, breathing society of 1.3 billion individuals who have their own hopes and dreams and uh, you know, successes and failures and aspirations and whose feelings and activities will be important in shaping the future of China. And to not have a sense of that, I mean, we don't really know whether the bulk of the Chinese people like the direction it's going now or are unhappy. We can't. We can, sort of guess that the lockdowns in Shanghai may have antagonized the urban middle class who were previously quite happy to go along because as long as they did it to the waiters but not to the urban middle class, that was fine. Will that have political consequences? Maybe, possibly. Do we have any sense of that because we're able to get around and talk to people? Not really. So we're, we're kind of you know operating in a void which I think is dangerous on policy level and a disservice to consumers and news. And ironically, it hurts China too. Because if the Chinese don't like the depiction of China as the evil empire 2.0, not allowing journalists to show that it's a living, breathing society full of ordinary human beings who don't spend all their time spouting wolf warrior slogans um, hurts them too. But I think they feel, well, we, we can use social media and our own outlets to tell our story. We don't need them. Yes, Alan Frank. Mike, what's your, what's your assessment of uh, the 
actual effect on U.S. relations with China by Trump's four years in office? I think it was an absolutely profound shift, although it wasn't uh, initiated by Trump. I think you can date the, the, the sort of beginnings of this shift to the Obama period. Uh, I think when uh, there was a kind of somewhat unrealistic notion when Obama took office, they were going to have this great cooperative relationship with China. If you read some of the stuff that his main Asia guy, Jeff Bader, wrote, that's what he talked about. But after the financial crisis, as I mentioned, I think the Chinese thought the Americans are downward and slow. And the, their, the first telltale sign of that came when Obama made his trip to China in 2009. And there's a section in the book where the reporters who were covering that trip talked about how the Chinese went out of their way. Were you in China? No. No. Um, to, went out of the way to humiliate him. You know, they, they, they wouldn't let him do a live press conference. They packed, the, they wouldn't let him speak where he wanted to speak. You know, they treated him like, oh, he's this young whippersnapper, and he, what does he know, and he's just a freshman, and so on. Um, and there was this kind of contempt, and I think um, that resonated. And, you know, it's not a coincidence that uh, after that, you saw the beginning of the so-called pivot to Asia and this more critical... Um, perception of China, although there really was an attempt still to try and make it work. Um, but then, you know, Trump came in and for all sorts of muddled, you know, reasons did, did what he did. But people around him who worked on China were very tough-minded, like Matt Pottinger, who some of you may know, it was a Wall Street, I knew him when he was a Wall Street Journal correspondent in Beijing. Um, and so I think they, you know, they really shifted gears. Um, but it's not unilateral, and some of the forces that are at work are China's own behavior. They, because the, it, the Chinese, uh, you know, started building uh, these man-made islands in the South China Sea with military use, and the Chinese were uh, being very provocative around the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands um, with Japan. The Chinese were pushing it already. Uh, I think the way Trump did it, like everything else Trump did, was clumsy and crude and stupid and counterproductive and alienating allies when you need allies. And I think Biden has done a much shrewder job. If you're going to counter China, you want to have the Japanese and the South Koreans and the others be on good terms and not be annoyed at you because you're gratuitously offending them. Trump calling the country shibbles. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, but it was an important Shit, but it wasn't, I mean, in Trump's case, it wasn't done out of principle, because he has no principles, but the people around him were much more hard-nosed about China. Um, but they were also responding to a shift in China's <laughs> behavior. It wasn't that benign China was just happily trundling along, and Trump came in and said, oh, we're going to stop them. Uh, please identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, thank you. My name is Yemei I'm a geopolitical analyst at uh, uh, Gamco Dragonomics. So listening to the narrative and looking at the slide that spans decades, I was struck by two contrasts. One is that the Chinese people's fashion has changed over time, but the fashion of foreign male correspondents has not changed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second contrast, which is the question, is it seems the paradox of when China was actually poorer, weaker, when it was just opening up to the world, Chinese leaders seem to be more confident. They you know, had this long form, freewheeling interviews. Uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping had that with Michael Wallace, and Jiang Zemin, Zhu Rongji had this freewheeling. Jiang Zemin had it with me. Right, freewheeling uh, press conferences. But when China became richer and more integrated with the world, the Chinese leaders clamped up. They closed themselves and never made themselves available to reporters. I could, you know, I could not recall recall anything that uh, Wu Jiabao or Hu Jintao did. Wu Jiabao did. One thing with Christian Amin, but less and, you're absolutely right, less and less and less. Right, so why is that a case? Ask them, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know, but there, you know, whether it's probably we're more successful, we don't need them. I think that's part of it. Um, and also, I mean, in more recent years, as the country has gotten more internally repressive, you know, who, what are these people to ask obnoxious questions? We don't have to deal with that, the kind of nonsense. We're the leader of China, so screw them. But I don't, I mean, but you know, I found that you can find online, there's a YouTube 15 minute clip of Edgar Snow talking to Joe and Lai in like 1964. And it's fascinating 
both to hear what Joe and I was like, but also the notion that Jiang Zemin would sit down, even with, even if there was a foreign interlocutor with whom he had, for whom he had as much trust and confidence as Mao and Joe and I had in Edgar Snow, it's inconceivable that he would do that because he's just too, too elevated. They, 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 they don't do that anymore. I think one turning point may have been the Bloomberg and New York Times reports about the wealth of Premier Wen and, and the other <laughs> Chinese officials, that the Chinese were shocked that the Americans' uh, media could penetrate in that way. Yeah, yeah. I think that was another seminal moment. Yes? Thank you. Uh, Anna Cash, I'm a writer and editor uh, based in China until uh, just last winter. Um, I was wondering if we could uh, flip reverse this and you could tell us about your uh, encounters or knowledge of Chinese correspondence in America and the West and how that has changed and uh, expanded or contracted uh, in the last decades. You know, I, to be honest, I can't really. I mean, I stopped being a CNN correspondent in 2006 and I haven't lived in the States in years, so I've had almost no dealings with them. So I, I mean, I have to, uh, I mean, maybe someone else has had more recent dealings. Um, I would assume that as the constraints on the media in China have tightened, uh, that shapes what they can and cannot say, but I haven't had any personal interactions as well. Michael, you know? So may we identify you as one of the Michaels? Uh, if you wish, yes. <laughs> I'd like to just be myself. Uh, Mike, uh, Michael Kovrig, uh, currently a senior advisor for Asia with the International Crisis Group. Uh, when, when I was a diplomat in China, one of the things that uh, I struggled to try to convey in diplomatic reporting was the atmosphere uh, around when you were talking particularly, not, not to average Chinese, but to government officials or anything that the party state and the government and the security organs touched, the, the degree to which there was a certain sense of, or sort of sense of fear or authoritarianism or oppression or control, you know, the nervousness in your interlocutor, for example, the fact that when you went to interview somebody or talk to somebody, there would often be someone else sitting with them to keep an eye on things like that. How, how did you and your colleagues over the years observe, partly, so how did that, atmo that sort of atmosphere change and evolve over time, and how did you deal with the challenge of conveying back to a reader who's never been, probably never been to China how it's different, how much more difficult it was to actually have that kind of conversation in, in China over the years than it would be in a, in a Western context. How do you get that across? It's a really, it's a really interesting question. As a TV reporter, it would have been really hard to do that because you just, you just see what you shot on screen, and you, you, know, you don't have the luxury of writing five paragraphs of context and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes people were very open. Sometimes people really had to be coaxed. Um, I was there during a period. I mean, there, you know, where where when when I I got there in '87, and it was a relatively upbeat time in China. And '88, I think, was the most open year uh, intellectually, in some respects, uh, in the whole history of the People's Republic. So it was a there were lots of, you know, lots of interesting people who were eager and willing to talk. There was a, the U.S. and China were friends. Um, there wasn't this kind of uh, edge. That, you know, there are plenty of situations where, you know, we weren't, we weren't allowed to go somewhere. Where they, they wanted all the questions in advance. Uh, getting people on camera was always a challenge. Um, and then, you know, we had Tiananmen and you had about 18 months when you really couldn't do anything. We didn't get permission to go anywhere, you know, just it's kind of spinning. Foreign, foreign ministry would say, Butai Fang Bien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 but then, you know, then it began to open up. And I remember um, hearing from, like, business people in, in, in Guangdong and in Shanghai, you guys are missing something by being fixated on human rights and whether or not the U.S. is going to renew most favored nation status, because that's not what's going on down here. And I did this trip, and I did a series called The Tale of Two Chinas in 92. And once that kicked in, as long as you framed what you were going to do as we want to look at, you know, the economic growth, the access was pretty good. And, 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 and I think throughout the 90s, in terms of that aspect of the story, it was okay. But I mean, David Barbosa told me at one point that um, 
Chinese companies, in, when he went in there as a business correspondent in the early 2000s, were, were, were more accessible than get an American multinational to tell you what they're doing in China, next to impossible. <laughs> Chinese companies, oh yes, New York Times. So, um, so it's kind of mixed in, and paradoxical. And, and as journalists, we almost never had the access at the level where what you were talking about. I mean, um, maybe um, I saw John Pomfret in, in San Francisco, and he said he would periodically have lunch with Sui Tian Kai, but it was the ambassador here. I never got that, but he would, you know, but it was all off the record. It was sort of like what you do in Washington, but I, I never got that. And so for us, if it wasn't in front of the camera, it didn't really help. So we have the room for an, another half an hour, but I see two questions. Uh, and then after we end, end the discussion, there'll be more beverages consumed, more socializing and connecting, I hope. And more books sold. And more books sold. <laughs> So this is the cash bar. The bar out there is a credit card bar. So if you want to spend cash, that's the place. The credit cards are out there. <laughs> so yes, where were those two questions? Yes. Please uh, identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, hi, I'm Colleen Harold, aspiring channel manager. And throughout your presentation, you talk a lot about the differences in China's approach to correspondence experiences. I was curious if you had any insights into the experiences of quote unquote fixers or Chinese citizen journalists and their experience of working with the Western media in China and how that has evolved as they also face increases of repression from the Chinese government. Yeah, the que for those of you who didn't hear, the question was about the, the, the Chinese uh, assistants or fixers who work with foreign journalists. Um, I, may, I, I say in the introduction to the book that, that I made a conscious decision not to include them in the book, simply because uh, asking them questions would put them in, impo in, in impo their position is so sensitive. Either they would have to make stuff up or lie or be evasive. If they were straightforward about it, they would get into trouble. They're just too sensitive. So I didn't include them in the book, but there's not a single correspondent who's been based in China and will not acknowledge the crucial importance of your fixer and your interpreter. And over time, the system for using and hiring those people evolved. When I was there, they just gave you, you got whoever you got from the, the DSB, from the Diplomatic Service Bureau, and, and you were stuck with them. And sometimes they were good folks, and they kind of got it, and sometimes they couldn't be bothered, and there was nothing you could do about it. Um, that, parenthetically, is why, um, for those of you who may know the, the name of Jaime Flora Cruz, Jimmy Flora Cruz, no. Cheeto Romano, Eric Bacalo now. There were these Filipino, left, they were left-wing students who went to China in 1971 on a friendship tour and discovered that they were on a hit list uh, ordered by, by President Ferdinand Marcos. And they basically stayed thinking it would be six months and it, it stayed till Marcos was overthrown, 15 years. And they all went to Chinese universities, became fluent in Chinese. And then when the Americans opened their news bureaus, uh, they, they suddenly were sought after because they had the Chinese language skills and they knew their way around the country, but they weren't locked into all of the pressures and the baggage that your average Chinese translator. And so they ended up, Eric ended up as bureau chief of NBC, Cheeto ended up as bureau chief of ABC, and then Philippine ambassador to China, sadly died last year. Jimmy ended up as uh, CNN bureau chief, and now he's the ambassador. Um, in, in, in Beijing, I just sent them a copy of the book. But their, their value was partly a reflection of the fact that you didn't get this kind of help. But as time went on, it became easier to hire people and it was one of these things where if you found somebody who was like, was really keen and you go to the DSB and say, put them in your system and, and, and they would be generally cooperative. So you had an evolution towards people who were much more journalistically minded and saw, I saw themselves as journalists. Um, were very helpful. I don't know what your experience, John and Mark. So, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we could uh, recruit uh, openly. They, they were still employed through the DSB. Um, and I think alongside everything we discussed tonight, it's, it's a really important question. I think the position that, the, that, that those Chinese nationals are in is increasingly difficult. But speaking personally and across the whole industry, they are some of the, the bravest, uh, most brilliant and inspiring people I've ever met. Uh, 
And they come under tremendous pressure. Their families get told your, 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 your son or daughter is a traitor, they're working for the foreigners. There have been any number of cases where people have been intimidated uh, into leaving. Some who have been hired full time, like Hayes Fan of Bloomberg News, was imprisoned. Um, so it's, it's, it's very tough, but they are, even if journalists have good Chinese, they are eyes and ears into a society in a way that people who look like us can never have. One last question is over here. No? Jan Alexander? Hi, I'm Jan Alexander. I've uh, been a, a business writer who has written about China for a long time. And um, I mean, the story until just a few years ago when you talked about China was often um, China dom you know, trying to be a, a dominant power when it came to technology, but uh, uh, beyond surveillance technology, things like uh, smart cars and all kinds of uh, just make if there was a made in well there was a made in China 2025 campaign that was designed to um, manufacture have all kinds of manufacturing high tech manufacturing coming out of China um, that would to some extent obliterate their need for uh, all of this Western involvement in, in their economy all this Western investment uh, and that they would in some cases. Um, be selling more to be more of an importer to the West and be just more of a dominant uh, economic to high tech power in that sense. Um, is that, I mean, you, you're hearing less about that and in the media mostly about uh, when you hear about Chinese technology, it's surveillance technology. But, um, you know, is, is that still a story that is worth looking at uh, just, to, just for the uh, uh, purpose of looking at the extent to which China uh, is going to use its manufacturing and technological and economic power um, to, uh, you know, try to overtake, uh, well, yeah, I, I know, think overtake yeah. uh, the United States uh, to, you know, make the target on it as a, yeah, as a world superpower. Yeah. yeah, I think it's absolutely an important story, and if. I mean, it becomes more important in the sense how they respond to the pressure from the Americans and other countries that are denying them certain kinds of technology and what they're going to do. Um, so yeah, it is, it is important. I don't know. I mean, I haven't been in China in a number of years, and I'm not sort of doing daily journalism. Would, would you go to China? Would you go? I'm not so sure I would. I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> Do that over there. We're, we're done for now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.